Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com here, and welcome to Stumped Q&A. What the heck is Stumped Q&A, Scott? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> this is my midweek follow-up to the weekend video. Every weekend I put out a video on a particular topic, and because I never seem to get my act together, there's always plenty of questions that should be answered. Uh, sometimes things I forget to mention. So that's what this video is. It's a follow-up to the weekend video where I set up the uh, Mark V for lathe turning and talked about some critical alignment and, and things that need to be done before you turn. And um, I, I, before I get into the questions, comments, and cheap shots from that video, I have to say thank you. I have the best viewers, the best subscribers, the best commenters in all of YouTube. I love the conversations that we have in the comment field. Thank you, guys. Even when you disagree with me, I appreciate that you're respectful and, uh, and you make your point, right? You, you make your, your case. So thank you. Let's start with Graham. Uh, Graham began by taking the, the name of a, a, a city in Ohio in vain where he said, Holy Toledo. It's okay, Graham. We'll forgive you. He says he, he's, he's amazed that he hasn't been hurt. I guess he crawled underneath his machine and found that Things weren't the way they should have been. So, uh, Graham, I'm glad that you got to it before that happened. Bruce said, um, oh, could you go over the process that you're going to use to clean up that tool, uh, uh, lay the tool post? The tool rest post on this machine has several things, including the joiner that I've already taken care of, um, were, were rusty. And it's just nasty. Basically, uh, Bruce, I'm going to do the same thing I did in the uh, the, the joiner video. I'll go over it with some WD-40 and scotch Bright and just polish it up. And uh, it's smooth now, so it's going to function just fine, but it's not going to get any better. So i gotta got to polish that up. So I'm, I'm, that, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to shoot another video on that. So um, Wayne said uh, his machine has a single set screw on the eccentric um, and that, that he's used that for alignment. Um, in fact, there were a couple of conversations about that eccentric cup. One of the questions was when Shopsmith added the second the set screw, did they change that eccentric in any way? Not, not that I'm aware of. Doesn't look like it. It's, uh, I think it's a cast. I think it's cast zinc, if I remember correctly. Um, if you are constantly moving that thing around, the tip of the set screw will eventually start to work its way into and through the walls of that eccentric. So they do... If you really use your lathe a lot, you may have to someday pick up a spare. Um, but I've never had a problem with mine because once I align it, I tend to leave it aligned. Um, you can turn tapers with it by offsetting it, but uh, I don't really tend to do that. So anyway, um, Chad, Chad, oh, Chad, Chad uh, mentioned me sacrificing safety for comfort by wearing a jacket. Okay, I was turning, and you're right, Chad, you shouldn't wear anything loose. I want you to note that these sleeves uh, are Velcro tight around my wrist. Uh, I think about back when I worked at Shopsmith, uh, back in those days, we were required to wear ties. And when we did our demos, we had this, uh, this red smock that would zipper up, to, and the whole purpose of that, that smock was to keep our tie from killing us on the lathe. And they were real ties, too. They weren't clip-ons. So uh, I think I'm a step ahead <laughs> of those days. Um, Ed mentioned the lift assist. Yeah, um, the lift assist is a device that clamps onto both the way tubes and the bench tubes, which I called something else in the previous video. Um, and the, the question is, is it applying forces that maybe could make things loose? Yeah, I would say so. I have a lift assist on a 510 back in my shop. And uh, that, that has given me pause. I need to go check that. Um, one bit of advice was maybe take a Sharpie marker, make a mark on these tubes right where they meet the casting. And that way you can just have a visual reminder to check to make sure that things are not moving apart. But if everything's tight, it shouldn't be an issue. But yeah, you are introducing some forces that were never designed for that machine. So yeah, it's not, not going to be a bad idea to check that. Um, Gary, not Linda, uh, mentioned the low height of the Shopsmith lathe. Yeah, it is. If you were to buy a standalone lathe, typical height for the spindle is your elbow. 
that make, makes this lathe about six to eight inches too low for me. I'm six foot tall now. Um, used to be six foot one, and I'm a little bitter about it. But <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I I had a job back in Dayton at one time working for an architectural millwork company, and we got a gig uh, doing a bunch of work for the uh, the Parks and Recreation Department there in Dayton. And one of the things I did was I turned some finials, huge finials. They look like pawns from a chess set. And uh, I turned them on my my own Mark V, the one that's in my other shop, my 510. And uh, it didn't take long before my back was aching because I was having to lean over. So I built uh, boxes that I could lift the machine up on. And the boxes were weighed with something, bricks or something like that. If you do a lot of turning, it's worth taking the time to build something to raise the machine up because your back will thank you. So great point, Gary. Um, Scott. So Scott says that uh, he, he has uh, restored some older shopsmith equipment. Some of them have a single set screw. Some of the double set screw on the tail stock. Um, and some of them don't have the large set screw that's designed to eliminate the twist in the way tubes. And uh, he says that he has drilled and tapped the casting to install that. That's actually smart. If you don't have that, it's a, a feature that was added that you will benefit from. It's easy to drill and tap these castings. And maybe we'll do a video on that one of these days. So good, good point, Scott. Um, let's see. JG disagrees with the purpose of the large set screw. Says his manual covers it and talks about how it's used to get the side table in alignment with the main table. Um, okay, there's probably four different variations of the manual that refer to that set screw. And again, at one point there was no set screw over there. Um, and it's been, it's been called upon for several different things. Here's what I'll tell you. Um, I never ever put my extension table on the left-hand side of my machine, partially because my jointer lives there. It never comes off. It's there all the time, and uh, it's there for weight when I'm turning and, and so on. But, but here's the reason why you're never going to catch me putting an extension table over there unless I'm putting it there just to offer support. I will never put an extension table on that side with a fence because even though it might be possible to get the tables in alignment this direction, which of course you can, I want you to notice this one's locked right now. Look, look at the amount of, of movement I can get between the way tubes and the two posts on that end. Um, so while my tables might be level, what did I just do? While my tables might be level over there, there's no way my fence can be parallel to my saw blade. I don't have that assurance. Um, if when we lowered that down from the drill press, if it didn't just lock in place, but maybe it indexed into something, you know, a couple, couple dowels or maybe a V block or something like that, then uh, that wouldn't ever be an issue. But it floats. Um, I've met people that have, have super tightened down the far end because they didn't want this thing moving around while turning. And what they found was the machine vibrates even more if you lock everything down. That's a, it's there and provides a little bit of tolerance. And so um, anyway, disagree with me. That's all right. I'm okay with that. Uh, let's see, James said, uh, Shopsmith instructions can be difficult to follow. Um, and how about, I can't, I'm looking at my own notes and I can't read them. <laughs> okay, uh, Shopsmith instructions, it just depends upon which ones you get. Um, they, they try and they try and they try to, to modify those instructions. Um, over the years, it goes back and forth between making sure that they're providing you with excellent information and then also making sure that they're covering their butts for liability. There's so much stuff in that owner's manual that's there to protect Shopsmith, and I can't fault them for that. I mean, there, I mentioned that there have been lawsuits. You know, half the labels on this machine are there because some idiot did something and uh, it did something wrong and then claimed it was Shopsmith's fault. So um, I, I would say... You know, that's being a corporate trainer, I can tell you we all learn differently. 
And I find those manuals to be excellent, but I can also understand how they can be confusing. So um, I'm happy to be here to provide what, uh, what I can do. There's obviously other people. Um, my gosh, Doug Reed has put out a million videos on YouTube. There's several others. And uh, hopefully we can get you answers if you can't get them from the manual. But also be sure that you get a copy of Power Tool Woodworking for everyone and that you get a copy that applies to your machine. Um, I'll link to that because it is such an excellent book. There's many, many versions of it, though, going back to the 1940s. So you want to be sure you get one that is correct for your machine. Uh, let's see. Paul said, um, what do you find are the turning limits of the lathe? Um, I, I kind of I put it. I link to a video that if you haven't seen it, your mind will be blown. I highly encourage you to check out the video of the guy turning what are basically porch columns. They're actually columns that support a balcony in a building, but he's turning porch columns with his Shopsmith Mark V. And he's mounted a pillow block on the wall to support uh, the other end of the spindle. Uh, the biggest thing I've ever turned without a speed reducer on my Mark V was a two-foot diameter um, brick laminated, um, basically a bowl. What it was was a frame or a mold that a guy was making Tiffany-style um, uh, stainless steel. Stainless steel? What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Stained glass. Uh, lampshades, and he uh, he hired me to build a couple of these in, in, in a Tiffany style, and I remember one of them had 286 miters in it, the way the thing was built. Anyway, um, I turned that by uh, turning the headstock around and turning it off the back of the machine, and I had a tool rest mounted to the floor, and everything was bolted down. Um, I learned a lesson from the guys in R&D at Shopsmith. I, I got some bags of sand and draped those over the way tubes and the bench tubes, just to add more and more and more weight to the machine and to help dampen vibration. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that. I'm not saying that you should be doing that, but the capacities of what, 32 inch spindles and 16 inches in diameter, it's possible. The trick is balance. You gotta have things in balance. So you, you give it a spin. Uh, what I would do if you had a spindle mounted between centers, big, big diameters. I'll use a face plate instead of the drive spin, uh, drive spur drive and um, have the face plate screwed into the end. Loosen the set screw that's holding it onto the quill so that it'll spin freely on the end of the quill and just give it a spin by hand. And you should observe that it should stop in different places. If it always stops in one side, that side is heavy you need to add weight to the other side. And you can do that by running things. Uh, I, I'll sometimes use screws through washers or through nuts on the opposite on the end of it to uh, provide some, some counterbalance. Um, if you're laminating things, you, you kind of want to keep an eye on the, the weight as well. All right, going back. So I had a couple people then did not like my answer to Paul. <laughs> Didn't like that I shared that video. Um, and I can't blame them, you know. Um, uh, Frankenberry disagrees uh, with me on the Shopsmith lathe capacities. Okay. And um, Spencer also asked questions about, you know, uh, about large capacities. Do what you're comfortable with, right? Know that if you're going to do something that is pushing the limits, that you're taking some risks. So do what you can to, 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 to mitigate those risks and uh, don't do anything that you feel like you're taking too, but too big of a risk. Don't don't be stupid. Stupid. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna edit that out. No, I'm not. All right. So uh, that's it for this one. Um, this weekend we're gonna get into some actual turning. We'll get those tools prepped. Uh, I played around a little bit with those, but I didn't really get them ready. And uh, we'll be sure we do that this weekend. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then. Make it a great day.